And that's where we left it last time. We were right here. And what we said was that now we have been able to move from practical microstrip lines to a parallel plate waveguide, if you remember. So we, we took that and made it like this, simple. And then we moved from there to finding some simple expressions using the parallel plate waveguide for expressions for capacitance and then also to the parallel plate for inductance where I would like to pay a, to, to make you pay attention to, we have epsilon r effective here and w effective there. One more thing, um, the material on your in your book is kind of concise um, and short, but it's good because I think by reading the that one chapter that we have in the book, which is chapter. Let me tell you, chapter 11, by reading, that's what we are going to spend most of our time from now on. <laughs> For the rest of the class, we are going to read chapter 11. But this is all of it, we're going to do it. And then plus my notes, that's what you're going to be responsible for. Because I'm going to, I'm not going to do more, more theory, if you like, on transmission lines, but we're going to do many more examples because the book is short but does not necessarily give enough, considering every other concept it covers, it does not give you enough time to understand the transmission lines that you will need to do if you wanna take a higher level circuits class, or even take say, for example, the equivalent to 453, which is um, microwave circuits and systems. You will not be able to go there and learn about a receiver or a transceiver, a Wi-Fi receive, a, a Wi-Fi or um, cellular or a kind of um, wireless receiver or transceiver without knowing this material. Okay, so now we have been able to find for a short section. So first of all, I want to remind you, this is the physical representation of the microstrip. This is what we call symbolic representation of the microstrip. Whenever you see two thick lines, not as thin as in circuits, these are thick lines and two together, you will see, we'll use them quite a bit. This is called the symbolic representation. So if I were right here is symbolic representation. And down, down here, you have the circuit representation. So this is the circuit. And remember, like we saw in, um, in our meter, not everything comes down to be a series or a shunt, a series or parallel. You need to remember that. Not everything in circuit design comes down to be to a series or a shunt representation. There are um, many circuits, if not the majority, that have this kind of representation, which is called what? Do you remember? And the, uh, we had that discussion with a few of you about uh, uh, in relation to the meter. But do you remember what are the fundamental um, representations? Of course, is the series. Let me use it, uh, resistors here. Just to, okay, that's a series. R1, R2, serious representation. Okay, that's one. Two is the parallel. Parallel. Three is a, is a star. If you remember, uh, 
Okay, so this is R1, R2, R1, R2, R3. Or you, that which translates to this representation. The triangular, however you call it. And we have ways of going from one to another. Do you remember those? Yes or no? From your 214. I do not. Ah, in that case, I would suggest you go to review it a little bit because these are fundamental and we are not necessarily going to do circuit design, circuit um, problems, but there, you may have at some point to read because everything is reduced to circuits in transmission lines. So for those of you who do not remember the last two, I suggest just go to one of your books in 214 and see exactly to, they talk about these uh, triangular representations. Why am I talking about that? Because if you look at this one, tell me what kind of representation is this? That is a triangular, isn't it? Or why? Somebody says a Y representation or an inverse Y, whatever. This is like that. And also just to remind you what I gave you, um, what we had between A and C, so parenthesis here, from meter what we had was something like that a c ground so um these are fundamental and but they are called fundamental because they cannot be reduced any further that's all that i wanted to tell you they are fundamental because they cannot be reduced they cannot be reduced any further so you remember that Okay, so now also the other thing that I wanted to attract your attention to is both for L and C. And that's where we found use, at least from the transmission lines point of view, the immediate use of electrostatics and magnetostatics comes in the um, expression for C, which we find for a parallel plane waveguide and L over two. You see L over two here because of two things. We try to find a symmetric representation of the circuit. Symmetric representations are extremely important because eventually they help you in many, many ways. So symmetric representation is something that always people go uh, reduce everything. And in that case, we have split L into two pieces. Uh, half, so we, we took L for the infinitesimally short line and we split it into pieces. So it's, it's practically as if we are saying that the capacitance is, we think that the capacitance is just placed at the center of the line. The inductance is, is half for the line. The other inductance is the other half of the line, practically. And so if I go here, and if you like, I can make a smaller circuit here. And in fact, and um, what I wanted to show here is this. And practically we make that circuit here like that, that you see underneath it. So here. That's kind of weird. I don't know exactly what it does that, but in any case, this one and this one. 
So we made that circuit, all right? Now, we move further down and now we try to extend the circuit with some more important elements. And here is what you have to keep in mind. When we have, and I will use that here, when we have a um, conductor, a, a wire, for example, let's assume that I have a wire here and wires look like this. They have a finite um, cross section. This is a wire, is not a filament. A filament, which I have talked about, is an ideal representation of a wire. And that's where the current flows. And this is called a current filament. A current filament is not any different from a point charge. All right, so a point charge and a current filament are idealistic representations of the current in the case of the filament and the charge in the case in the the charge in the case of uh, electrostatics. Are However, filaments, sorry, are filaments always infinite? Yes, unless we specify and say we have a section of a filament. If I say that I have a section of a filament, it means a section. If I say it's a current filament, it means infinite. Correct. So the wire, of course, has a, a, a cross section. And depending on the material you're using, uh, the wire, well, it's um, it will not be a perfect conductor. All right. So. What happens when you don't have a perfect conductor, a wire which is not a perfect conductor? So I will say here, not perfect conductor. I'm not gonna go into the mathematics of this, but I will just tell you of what is happening when you don't have a perfect conductor. So I will not, I, I erased it because I want to make it a little bigger. So in a perfect conductor, I would do that. The current here will be like this, all right, on the surface. So I will put it like this here because it's right on the surface. There is no depth to it. So let's assume that the current was going like that inside to in, in the board all around. When they, wire is not perfect conductor, what happens? There is part of the current that flows inside. So there is gonna be current that if the value of the current on the surface says, if I were to take this line, for example, all right, and plot, this is going through the center of the wire. If I were to take this line here, and, and then go in the, in the case of an imperfect conductor and go and measure along this line how the current goes on the conductor, what I would find is the following. I will plot it here next to it. I will find, let's assume that this is point A, this is point O. So point A here, point O here, so the current here will have the maximum value on the surface, and then it's gonna go down like this exponentially inside the conductor. So that would be the value of the current inside the conductor here. It would start with the maximum value and then it would go exponentially inside. Okay, so in the current, if it is, I not here, like the maximum on surface, surface of conductor. Here, it goes as I not e to the minus a number a, and if this is the, say, uh, x direction here, so this is at A is zero and then it moves in. And at this point at O is the radius of the wire. 
let me erase that, put it here, the radius, so here is x equals, not a, x equals, what do I want to call the radius of the wire? Ah. Um, if this is, let's call this 2w for the wire, or to, um, how do you gonna call this, to B? We'll call this B because we have used W above. We don't wanna mess up with that. Okay, how that goes like this, all right? So inside the conductor, inside the conductor, the wire rather, the current diffuses. It still has the same direction, all right? So the current still has the same direction here if you like, if you want me to show it. It, it is, if I were to show it here, the current would still be like this, the same direction, but it would go down exponentially. One question? Yes. Uh, so the graph uh, E power to negative is, it's about to go down or, or it's about it, it need to be go up because uh, I think that e power to negative it it will go down to infinity go down to zero when it's go to infinity yeah but it depends on the a oh, okay. uh, it depends on how large the value a is how fast it's gonna go down oh, okay <laughs> all right and so, for example, if I may do finish this one here for a second. So if A is very large, then it's going to go down very quickly. So it's not going to be exactly zero, but it's so small that it's practically zero. Okay. It is true that it goes to zero at infinity, but it goes to practical zero very quickly. Now, there is, why do I do that? Because we are gonna see a quantity that is called the skin depth. Have you heard about this before? Who has heard about the skin depth? Anybody? I have. Okay. Um, what, could you tell us what is the skin depth in your own words? Um, usually for high frequency AC signals, the current tends to propagate on the surface of the conductor, but that is not perfect because the, con the conductor does not have perfect conductance. So some of it tends to propagate inside the conductor. And I think if I remember correctly, it's a function of one over alpha. Exactly. So the skin depth, how do we define the skin depth? We defined it as the delta, as if the distance A, so we call it skin depth is delta where the current inside the conductor at delta equals E naught divided by E. Exactly, so practically delta is one over A. You see that? That's the definition of the skin depth. Why we define it like that? I don't know. People define things and then everybody's using them. So for example, when you say the skin depth, I have a conductor and the skin depth is like a fraction, it is like a 10th of a micron, a hundred nano. It means that the, the current flows inside the conductor by one tenth of a micron until it becomes one or one of one over E of its maximum value. Okay, that's the skin depth. And what is the other interesting thing about the skin depth? The, do you know about, since you talked about high frequencies, do you know how whether the skin depth changes with frequency? Who knows that? Skin depth changes with frequency. Do you know how it changes? It goes, you remember which symbol we are using to show how it varies? We use this symbol. 
Do you know what the symbol means? That is of the order of, all right? It's not exactly equal. It's not bigger, it's not less. It's of the order of square root of F. What does that tell you? The higher the frequency, then what? The more the current goes inside the conductor. And what does that mean? If it goes inside the conductor, what is why, why do we worry about going inside the conductor? Because when the current goes inside the conductor, it starts increasing resistance. Con the conductor, one of the characteristics of a conductor is the resistance. A conductor, let me in fact use this one, this one. Let's assume that we have this conductor has conductivity, a finite conductivity, all right? That's why also the current flows inside. A, car, a finite correct conductivity is called also the inverse of a conductivity is called resistivity. So here we have resistivity, which is rho and is measured in ohms per unit length. and is one over sigma. All right, so that gives you how, um, what is the resistance to the current inside? What does that mean? It means when I force electrons to move inside the conductor, because that's what happens, all right? So the current is nothing else but free electrons moving. When they're moving on the surface of the conductor, they are going straight, no problem, all right? There's nothing there to stop their movement. But inside the conductors, the metals have a particular structure, all of the metals have a particular structure that is called a crystal. How many of you have heard about this? Okay, well, there is a particular structure that is called a crystal. What is a crystal? A crystal means, so let me ask, uh, enter here, one more thing, I bet. So inside the conductor, metals are like that. That means, I will, now it's hypothetical because every metal has its own crystallic, uh, you know, structure. So a crystal can be a cube. That means it can be something like that. That all of the atoms inside the metal arranged in a periodic fashion and they are all occupying the edges of a geometrical structure. So you can have that all of the, um, and then it's another one here. and so forth. All right, so that is what happens inside a cube, a, excuse me, a metal. Now, where these ones here are all the atoms. And you remember that every atom has a nucleus and then all of the electrons that are around it. So if I, if I take now an atom like this, and as I said to someone, some of you, that this is a very symbolic representation of an atom, all right? Nucleus, and then you have different electrons moving. Now they're moving at different, it's not exactly, an electron does not have a mass. An electron is like energy, it's an energy cloud, but anyways. So we represent it like this. All of this in the metal, all of these are very nicely placed. All right, so let me look at this one here because I have space to put the electrons around it. Assume that this is the center and then the, there are electrons here and they all move nicely around it. They are all in a very nice structure. And then what happens here is that you have all of a sudden a current, its own electron. So you have these three electrons that run 
with a tremendous speed, and that's, let's assume that's your current, so I'll make it, what color should I make it? This one. That run because they are part of the current. And what happens when they come deep inside the crystal? When an electron like this comes here, it, it comes into, it crashes over another electron. And when you have two electrons that come into contact, one here and another here, and this one with a speed rather, but they both have speeds, but this one has a very particular speed along that direction. It hits this one and then it scatters it, not only by itself, but if they hit, then this is gonna go, go probably like that. And this is gonna go down like here. So practically the blue one. So what happens is that the green electron is gonna move like this, the blue here. And then the green electron is gonna go like that. But the green electron is, even if it's gonna displace, it's not gonna leave its atom. It's gonna be displaced for a moment and come back. But the blue is gonna change its direction and it's gonna go and hit another electron. So practically the blue is gonna have inside the conductor, it's gonna be its movement, it's gonna be a continuous, it's gonna go like this. And every time it hits another electron, it loses energy. Why it loses energy? Because when one electron hits the other, and this was say, was not moving, for example, and the blue one comes here and hits it with a force, hits it with a force. The reason the negative electron goes up then, like here, and then it, 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 the, neg the reason the negative electron moves is because there is transfer of energy from the blue to the green. And the green moves and then it comes back. When there is a transfer of energy, you lose energy. You lose energy from the blue. You lose energy from your current. So as your current comes inside the conductor, then it also slows down, which means that you have losses. And the losses in this conductor are represented by this resistivity, because if you know the conductor, if you know its crystal structure, you can make a microscopic analysis and you can find out how an electron is gonna slow down by understanding all of these, um, all of these um, um, transfers of energy every time it collides with another electron. So all of these collisions, one right after the other will create an equivalent value of resistivity, which means that as your electron goes through a piece of a wire from here and the way we have it, okay, was for the electro for the current to go to enter from here like this and to come out from here like this. But what is gonna enter is gonna be higher in value from what is gonna come out. So the equivalent that means that there is gonna be an energy drop between points A and point B. And this energy drop, we represent it with a resistor because we change, we um, equate the energy drop, that is the energy that is carried by the current, we equate it in a drop of a potential. That's also how, right? You can you can say that the potential from VA to VB is lower. So VA here and VB there. So VA is larger than VB, which implies that I can have a resistor here R. And when the current flows from left to right, if the current flows like this, then practically I lose 
part of my power into a resistor. That's all it means. All right, and that happens because of all of this here. So the skin depth, the higher the skin depth, which increases with frequency, then the higher the voltage drop along the resistor, all right? And we normally, if you have that in circuits, we will show that with the resistance. So the resistance are here. It comes into the picture because of that. I'm not gonna expand into a similar kind of thing, but also the material that um, separates the two conductors, that material has losses which means the magnetic field now, because the current is inside the wire, but the magnetic field that is created from the current is inside the material and also the electric field, all right? You remember that if there is an electric field that goes like this, and there is a magnetic field around the wire that goes, depends if that is gonna go like that. like this. Both the electric and the magnetic field, they will um, go through inside the dielectric that separates the two conductors. And as they go in, the same way they start interacting with now the crystal structure or the material structure of the dielectric. And if that of course, for the same reasons as I explained before, the electric field and the magnetic field, they will try to displace the electrons from their atoms in the structure of the dielectric. And that is going to cause energy to be able to take into consideration the losses from the material. So the material is not a perfect dielectric, it's gonna be a traditional dielectric and has losses because of that, all right? Because you're gonna, the electric field are gonna, that can displace the electrons. In a perfect dielectric, you cannot displace anything. Perfect dielectric, you cannot displace. There is an infinite inertia that keeps the electrons on their atoms. But in a finite, in a real dielectric, you can displace them, which means you lose energy every time you try to displace an electron from its nucleus. And that is represented in a circuit form by this, by a conductance. Because the conductance is due to the dielectric losses inside between the two conductors, that's why we show it in a parallel configuration with C. And R is in a series configuration with L. And this is now how we are representing, and then here I try to explain that, both R and G. R is in series, G is in shunt configuration. And both of those will be given to us for a given conductor. It's not something that we have to compute, to know by ourselves. Either they're gonna give us a formula or they're gonna give us this information explicitly. So always, why are we here now? Because now we have a complete form, and in this particular case, it's not exactly symmetric, all right? So in a real, um, in a representation which is more symmetric, I will have L and R on both sides, but half values, L over two, R over two on the left of the circuit of the C and G, uh, L over two and R over two on the right of L of C and G, or I will have them in an asymmetric like this. You will see it in both ways if you look at different books. So that's why I represented both of you. None of this is wrong because obviously all of this applies to a unit length line. Do you see that what I say here? A unit length line means that DZ. It's a very short line. Those do not apply the way you see them, do not apply for sections of lines that have an, a longer length than DZ or 
I will put it here to, to clarify it, which is DZ. They do not apply for anything longer than DZ. Why are those important? They are important because in a short section of a line, do you see what I have here? I have a section of a line that is DZ or I call it Delta Z practically. It's the same thing. And is infinitesimally short, obviously. And for this, I have a representation of this line with R, with L, with C and G. At this moment, before we continue, I wanted to ask you, um, do you guys remember when you change, you go to the frequency domain and circuits and you re replace um, L with J omega L and C with J omega C? Do you remember those? Yes, but I was under the impression that the impedance of a capacitor was one over J omega. Yeah, yeah, but the capacitor itself is replaced by J omega C. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, but then it's one over, of course. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about this in detail. But then by doing this, um, so this is primarily to show you that now I can go in this very, very short section of line and apply Kirchhoff's laws, all right? I have replaced L by J omega L, C by J omega C, C, not the impedance of C. G and R remain the same. So G is conductance and is in, in parallel with the capacitance. R is resistance and is in series with the inductance. The inductance now is J omega L. The capacitance now is J omega C. And that takes us into a frequency domain, okay? Which we call in circuits, the phasor domain. Now that applies, implies one thing. When we move into, let me ask you maybe, and then I will clarify that. When we move into a frequency domain, when we say, what is the fundamental assumption we make about the source? Now we, we, we look at this section of line. Okay, we look at this section of line. And then I wanna ask you, oh, so far so good, but we have indirectly made an assumption about the source that excites it. And what is this assumption? What kind of a source? do we have that excites the line? Sinusoidal. Yes. That's what we call an AC source, all right? And an AC source practically, so assuming all of these, what? That excitation is assuming a voltage excitation in the time domain that has a value and is a cosine of omega t. All right, that's what we assume. And you have seen that in circuits. So this one is also called a harmonic excitation because it's only one harmonic, only one frequency. Why do we call it harmonic? Where did the name come from? Does the solution of the cosine satisfy Laplace's equation? True, but also the name harmonic came out of music, where one, say in the piano, if you hit one key is one frequency. And because you create harmonies out of many frequencies like that, but it's a combination, then it came the name from it. But it is true, exactly the way you defined it. All right. So now with all of these assumptions, we go back. And um, the one thing that I also wanted to remind you 
is, and possibly I will make this here as an intro, add, add page, and, okay, we added a page. I'm gonna take this piece and put it up there. Put it up here. Okay, so now we assume that we have one harmonic excitation and then from here we define the phasers. Do you remember phasers from your circuit? What is a phasor? When we have V of T to be equal to V naught cosine omega T, that and V naught is a scalar number, positive scalar, okay? V naught is larger than zero. And it's of course a real number, all right? So real number. Then we can write that V of T is nothing else but the real part of V naught e to the J omega T. -t. J omega t is a complex number and therefore V naught e to the J omega t where V of omega is V naught, here we can write it like that, real, or V of omega, where V of omega is V naught e to the J omega t, all right? And now V naught is called the phasor. So if in a circuit that we have moved in this form, so if I have a circuit here with a V of T, Let me do this for the example. C, L, and R, V of T. Then we can move, this is in time domain. Then we move this, then it's a transformation to another domain, which we call the phasor domain. Well, now the source is V naught. Resistors remain the same. Resistors is the, are the same. Capacitors are J omega C and inductors, why does it do that? and inductors become J omega L. And now we have removed the time dependency and we have gone into a phasor domain and therefore in the phasor domain like this, as you have done before, we can apply all of circuit rules that we've learned. And therefore, from now on, in transmission lines, we are going to assume the phasor domain, which is what we have here in phasor domain. So do you remember about um, complex numbers? Yes or no? Did you have, you remember those about uh, the properties of complex numbers? Yes. Okay, we will have a review of those, a short review later. But what you see here is in the phasor domain. The solutions now, assuming always that we will do this, what I showed you, so it's how we define phasors and how we go from a time domain to the phasor domain, we are gonna always do like this without even making reference to it anymore, okay?
And that's what you see here below, which is how you solve this simple circuit it has an input A, A prime, an output B, B prime, how we solve it. And that's what we are gonna do next um, on Wednesday. Any questions so far? Okay. So I will see you either uh, early in the office hours on the early part of the office hours or and I will email those that I would like to start the day with. He'll make them individually. And or I will see you on Wednesday. Or if you have any questions, let me know. By email. Hey, Professor. Yes. I just have one question. So uh, because of my work, I can only attend the last half hour of the office hours. So from 530 to 630. Okay. Uh, if, if by any chance, if I have a question and I'm not called, uh, can I still ask questions or no? Um, okay. Um, yes, you can. You can join, and then after I finish that, if unless I cover something that addresses a question, but you can ask a question. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So I will see you later.